Well, we're going to be talking about prayer in this session together. And it's very easy to feel like a failure with regard to prayer. It's something that, as Christians, a lot of us struggle with. We feel like we're always falling short, that we should be doing more. And this may partly be to do with the models of prayer that are held up for us, spiritual giants of days gone by who spent hours in prayer every day, often supported by domestic staff to cook meals and clean the house, as well as childcare provided by others. Such great men and women of the monastery and mission field can seem far removed from us today with the professional cut and thrust that we live with. So today we're going to look at how we can explore practically and without guilt what it looks like for 21st century families um, with jobs and um, other commitments, what it looks like for people like us to grow deeper in prayer. Well, I think it's encouraging that in the Bible, one of the most significant models of prayer is seen in the life of a man who was tremendously busy. Yet this man um, wrote and, and prayed prayers that were so powerful and beautiful that we are enriched by them today, 2,000 years later. Let me give you an example. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on, and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a beautiful prayer. Who wrote that prayer? The Apostle Paul. Paul was an activist. Paul was a great organiser. Paul was a critical and quick-tempered person. Paul was gifted intellectually. Paul was also proud. He admits this to us in Philippians 3. And yet a man like that was able to be deep in prayer. Activists, people who love getting their hands dirty, often struggle with prayer because we like achieving things with our own hands. We believe in the solutions that we're capable of finding. Great organisers, those who are administratively gifted, don't often rely on prayer. Those who are gifted intellectually tend to rest back on their own abilities. Prayer mustn't have come easily to Paul, such a man as that. Yet in the New Testament, God gives him to us as a model of personal prayer. Whatever our personality, whatever our temperament, whatever our giftedness or lack of giftedness, it is possible for us to become men and women of prayer. C.S. Lewis said this about prayer. He said, prayer is either a sheer illusion or a personal contact between embryonic incomplete persons and the utterly concrete person. In it, God shows himself to us. I want to take a few moments and look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Because in that passage, some of the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him a fundamental question, a question that we're really asking today. They ask him the question, how should we pray? Let's read it together. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Do you hear the question there? How should we pray? The disciples ask this question and Jesus doesn't shoot them down and say, what? You've been with me all this time. <laughs> You've had your Jewish tradition and you still don't know how to do this, you failures. Not at all. In answer to the question, how should we pray? Jesus answers them with a very practical solution, the Lord's Prayer. Well, first of all, he says, Father, hallowed be your name. And from this, I think we can see that prayer begins with contemplating who God is 
and who we are in the light of who he is. Father, hallowed be your name. Jews never called God Abba, this word that we have here. It has never been found in early literature as a means of addressing God. And yet, this Aramaic word, Abba, is the first word of babies, like in the English language, Dada. And it could not be more intimate. In contrast with never finding this word used of God elsewhere in ancient literature, we see that Jesus nearly always uses this word, Abba, when speaking of God as Father. 170 times in the Gospels, Jesus calls God Father. And at times, the Greek word pater is used as a translation of this Aramaic Abba. But this is how Jesus prays throughout the Gospels, every time except when he's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is only Jesus who calls God Abba, and yet the unimaginable privilege of the Christian is that we are invited to address God as Abba, as Father. When you pray, says Jesus, say Abba. Now you find this throughout the New Testament, implementing Jesus' teaching on prayer here. The Pauline congregations, for example, Galatians 4 verse 6, call God Abba. And the non-Pauline congregations, Romans, in Romans 8 verse 15, remember Paul had never met the Romans, and he tells them, call God Father, call God Abba. And even though they're writing, he's writing in Greek, this Aramaic word, this tender, intimate, beautiful, powerful word is included in that Greek worship. The intimate, personal relationship that nobody had with the Lord before as an individual, before Christ's coming, is something that all of us can have because of Jesus. How should we pray, say the, say, say the disciples? And Jesus answered, when you pray, say, Abba. The beginning of prayer is contemplating and knowing who God is, that God is our Father, that in him we have found that Father that we have all longed for without distortion. The privilege of being a Christian is that we can address God as Father. So that foundation, that first foundation of our prayer life that Jesus gives us is contemplative prayer, to contemplate who the one we are praying to is. So as you pray, let that be your foundation, that you are able to address God as Father. Then secondly, we see Jesus telling the disciples to pray, your kingdom come, petitionary prayer. In Matthew, This um, continues on, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. In other words, when you come to God as Father, contemplating who he is, you can also bring your petition to him. But let your petition be shaped by God's agenda. Your kingdom come. Please, Lord, let your agenda reign, not my agenda. Now, often we fear praying this prayer. We fear inviting God's kingdom to come because we fear that God's will might make us miserable. So we want to jump to praying for our agenda, our ideas. Now Jesus makes a way for that as we'll see. But we begin with petitionary prayer shaped by his kingdom. C.S. Lewis writes in The Weight of Glory, if you ask 20 good men today, what they thought the highest of the virtues, 19 of them would reply unselfishness. But if you asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied love. You see what has happened? A negative term has been substituted for a positive. The negative ideal of unselfishness carries with it the suggestion, not primarily of securing good things for others, but of going without them ourselves as if abstinence and not their happiness was the important point. 
I do not think this is the Christian virtue of love. The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We're told to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do so contain, contains an appeal to desire. If there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has crept in from Kant and the Stoics and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is, is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Your kingdom come. Petitionary prayer is our prayer shaped by the purpose, the passion and the power of Jesus' kingdom. And that that comes first. And believing that his kingdom coming is a wonderful, a beautiful thing to petition him for. Not a miserable thing. His light in our dark world. His beauty in our corrupt context. His rescue in our hopelessness. This must shape our prayer, petitioning God for his kingdom's sake. But then thirdly, we see this prayer. Give us today our daily bread personal prayer. We've seen that we contemplate who God is, Father, hallowed be your name. We see that we petition God, shaped by his kingdom, let your kingdom come. And now we see, give us today our daily bread, personal prayer, that we are expected to and encouraged as Christians to pray for our personal needs to transfer away from self-reliance to God-reliance so that as believers in our prayer life, we don't rely on or rest on our inherited wealth, our inherited religion, our genetics, our intellect, our status, our job, our earning power, our appearance, our ability to get things done, but we rely on him. When you pray, says Jesus, pray, give us today our daily bread. Rely on God for everything you need. Ask him for your personal needs. Come to him in prayer and ask him to work personally in your life, your family, your workplace, your neighbourhood. And pray as somebody utterly dependent on him. And then we see this fourth phrase. Forgive us our sins. Confessing prayer. One writer said this, if our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been for technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been for money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been for pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was for forgiveness. So God sent us a saviour. Our greatest need is addressed here. Forgive us our sins. Jesus encourages us when we're asking him, how should we pray? How do I pray? Jesus encourages us to come to Father God, confessing our sins and receiving his forgiveness. It's very basic, but it's fundamental to the Christian life. So how practically can we grow in prayer day to day? Be it confession, personal prayer, petitionary prayer, or contemplative prayer. I wanna spend a few moments together exploring what that might look like rooted in daily life. How practically and creatively can we grow deeper in this whole area of prayer? Well, the first way I believe we can do this is to learn how to pray the scriptures. You see, sometimes we may kneel down in our room and begin to pray, but very quickly the words run dry. We run out of things to say to God. 
We run out of energy, if you like, in that conversation. But in the Holy Bible, we have a resource filled with examples of others' worship and prayer of God. And if we take those words into our own mouths and begin to pray them and live them ourselves, we find that we can overcome that struggle of of words running out by personalising the words of others. I found in my own life a great place to start is the Psalms, since this is a book of prayers to God. And a great series within the Psalms is Psalm 84 to 106. Now, sometimes I might take a whole Psalm or sometimes a few verses, but what would it look like to pray the Scriptures, to pray the Psalms? Well, imagine a swimming pool, a beautiful pool of water, And on the side of that swimming pool is a diving board, a really great bouncy diving board that you might remember from your childhood. And you get up and you climb the ladder onto that diving board and you walk onto the edge of it and you begin to jump. And then you launch off that diving board into that beautiful swimming pool. That's what the Bible is like. It's like a launch pad for our prayers. Let's take Psalm 84, for example. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. What would it look like to pray that scripture? Well, I might read that and I would encourage you to read it aloud. Often our prayers run dry because we pray in our heads. We don't vocalise physically to God. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. And we might begin to pray off the back of that. Imagine that is your diving board. Lord, I feel distant from your dwelling place, but I want to enter that beautiful place of your presence. I believe by faith that that is a lovely, a wonderful place, and I want to enter that place this morning. My soul yearns even faints for the courts of the Lord. Well, it may be that that morning as I read that psalm, that's true. I can echo, (coughs) yes, Father, in my heart, I'm crying out to be in your presence. Or it may be that I feel distance from God. So a real genuine prayer would be, as I read this, Lord, I don't identify. I know that my heart is dry, but I want to cry out and thirst and long for your presence. Help me, Father, as I come before you this morning. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. I want to be that person who dwells in your house. I want to be that person who praises you all day, not just this morning, Father, but as the day goes on, let praise be part of my life today. Do you see? It's a launch pad. That's just an example. The the Psalms, or actually lots of other places in the scripture, can be like a diving board. So that's my first practical hint that I would want to share today. Pray the scriptures. What a wonderful way to begin in prayer. I find that when I do that, when I pray the scriptures, those words often stay with me all day as I'm worshipping, as I'm making supper for my children, as I'm at work the scriptures begin to soak in to that whole day. Then a second practical thing we can do is prayer walking. Prayer walking, what is that? Well, prayer walking is to get up and walk as we pray. (laughs) Often um, that uh, stultifying prayer life that we all know exists and perhaps we own exists because we're sitting in a little room hunched up and We're not getting out and engaging with God physically. Prayer walking can be to retreat into God's beautiful creation, to walk in his creation and to pray and speak to him as we go, to contemplate him. Or prayer walking can be to pray as we walk the streets in which we live, praying and petitioning God for his kingdom to come where he has placed us to get God's heart for a place, to listen to him and hear the things that he may (coughs) want to tell us about that place. So prayer walking, praying the scriptures and prayer walking. Then thirdly, there's creative prayer. We can pray and express our thoughts and passions to God through the arts. 
In Exodus chapter 31, we read that Bezalel is anointed by God to create art and craft work to the glory of God. And we can pray as we make art that glorifies God. See, the Lord says to Moses, I've chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I've filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, to engage in all kinds of crafts. So we can create something beautiful and pray creative prayer. Then fourthly, practical prayer. Brother Lawrence writes this, the most holy practice, the nearest to daily life and the most essential for the spiritual life is the practice of the presence of God. That is to find joy in his divine company and to make it a habit of life. Practical prayer is to consciously pray whilst doing practical things, menial tasks like cooking, <coughs> cleaning, serving the family, like childcare, wiping the table, stacking the dishwasher, putting out the chairs in church, or doing practical tasks in the workplace. Brother Lawrence encourages us, don't disconnect menial, practical tasks of service that are part of your life from your spiritual life. <coughs> Practice the presence of God in those moments. I know in my own life that I've found that to be fundamentally transformational, particularly when I had children and my life dramatically changed and suddenly I was wiping a lot more than I had in previous years, whether it was faces, <coughs> bodies, tables, chairs, the whole house. And reading the works of Brother Lawrence and being encouraged as a Christian, as I'm doing these menial things, cooking food for people, I can know through prayer, the presence of God. Fifthly, we have meditative prayer. This is where we take a verse or a memorised passage of scripture and we meditate on it. That is a bit like chewing it over and over in our minds all day long. So when your mind is wandering, you're on the commute somewhere, you're jogging and your mind is blank, Think about and chew over a passage of scripture, repeating the phrases and praying off the back of them, meditative prayer. Then sixthly, what I would call connected prayer. That is to pray in a way that is connected with other Christians in the seasons of the Christian year. And it protects us from Lone Ranger spirituality. <coughs> So it may be that um, in November, when Suffering Church Sunday comes and we have a period in the Christian calendar when we think about the Suffering Church, that we're particularly intentional about praying for persecuted believers. We do that all year round, but we're connected with other Christians. Or during Advent, the time traditionally when we think about the second coming of Christ, that we pray daily for Jesus to return. That over Christmas and New Year, we pray with other believers or Lent in the build up to Easter when we're perhaps fasting like other Christians are. We're praying and crying out to God in a connected way. And this goes on throughout the year, prayer that is, is seasonal. Then seventhly, there would be a quiet time, a daily time of personal prayer and Bible reading. And I would encourage you to consider having that time at the same time every day, forming a habit, a habit of daily prayer, so that you don't easily miss it or forget about it, having a quiet time. Then eighthly, family prayers. If we're married or have children, um, that's kind of obvious how you do that. But many of us live in shared accommodation. We live in community. And praying together in our home, in the place where we live, is an important part of the Christian life. And I would encourage you, if you live alone, to have close Christian friends, perhaps a prayer triplet or a prayer partner, with whom you are committed to having that kind of family prayer. Again, in my own life, I know growing up as a child in a Christian home, Every day as a family, we gathered to pray after we'd eaten our food together. 
And we did not miss that time of family prayer from the youngest to the oldest. Ninthly, we might have what we call soaking prayer. This is a longer time of prayer that we may set aside once a month, perhaps. Or if that's, we haven't got that, maybe once a term where we set aside a morning or an evening or perhaps some time on a Saturday during which we will dwell in the presence of God for a sustained longer time. This is called soaking prayer because it's a bit like when you have a really dirty saucepan and that food is stuck on and you can't get it off, but you're going to soak it in soapy water for a long time. And you imagine your life like a pan, like a dirty pan, and you, you come to God and perhaps lie down in his presence or kneel down, but give him time, a sustained, a longer period of time, perhaps two or three hours where you soak. Intercessory prayer is that consistent, faithful prayer for people we know, our family, our church leader, unbelievers we know, God children, people in our lives that we name before God regularly. I would encourage daily, but perhaps we can't manage that the community we've been placed in, the countries of the world that we long to see God at work in, intercessory prayer. Now, practically, I would encourage you to have lists. A list in your Bible, a list on your fridge, a list on your bathroom mirror, a list perhaps on if you have a, a computer that you work at in your workplace, maybe a small post-it note, listing the things that you are committed to praying for so that every day or you know maybe three or four times a week you faithfully name these things before God intercessory prayer frightening that it's often the one on the mirror that we see most frequently because we're looking I'm looking in the mirror too much obviously eleventhly prayer journals keep a journal of your prayers Write down what you've been praying for, meaningful Bible verses and answers to prayer. It's so incredibly encouraging to look back over a prayer journal from the previous year and, and remember some of the things you agonised over before God in prayer and to read them again with hindsight and see how God answered. And then lastly and twelfthly, corporate prayer. Commit to praying with other believers regularly in your local church. Maybe that in your workplace there's a prayer group or the school that your children go to that you need to commit to too. Commit to praying with other believers, yes, in your family or your support network, your prayer triplet, but definitely also wider than that, the Christian community that you're part of. Commit to praying with other believers. So these are some practical ways, corporate prayer, prayer journaling, intercessory prayer, soaking prayer, family prayer, a quiet time, connected prayer, meditative prayer, practical prayer, creative prayer, prayer walking and praying the scriptures. Some practical ways in which we can take the model of Jesus and go deeper, contemplating our Father, hallowed be your name petitioning your kingdom come your will be done personal give us today our daily bread and confessing forgive us our sins amen as amy or ewing of ravi zacharias international ministries has just shared with us prayer is an essential part of the life of the disciple and the good news is that Jesus has left with us a model for prayer in the Lord's Prayer, as she has shared with us. As well, the scriptures tell us that we can pray in the morning, we can pray in the afternoon or the evening. We can pray while we're walking, while we're sitting down, while we're standing up. We can pray by ourselves, with others. We can pray in large groups and small groups. Prayer is something we can do out loud or we can do it quietly. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says this, We are to pray without ceasing or pray continually. In other words, prayer is to be a little bit like breathing. It's something we do throughout the day. It's also something we set aside time for, like eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And as we pray throughout the day, God will direct us and guide us and also respond to our prayers. C.S. Lewis wrote, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time waking and sleeping. Lewis goes on to say that ultimately prayer changes us. 
I challenge you to make the practice of prayer a regular part of your daily routine, just like eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And as you converse with God and listen to God throughout the day, I believe that you'll become a much more powerful and joyful disciple of Jesus Christ.